<laughs> yep, yep. Sometimes it also helps to rewrite the program entirely from scratch. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, so I rewrote the function. This uh, it's a function that crashes. I rewrote okay, the function I, like eleven times, different when I, ways. When I took operating systems you know, as a class at a as a, a as a uh, upper division class <clears throat> at a four year university, um, I had to work on the homework assignment. It's basically plain pong but it has three processes. So the processes have to talk to each other using the concept of a pipe, okay? So it was, it was the first time, you know, they did not teach C programming, okay? So prior to that, um, in my generation, we learned Pascal as the quote unquote, you know, de facto standard programming language in college. But in operating systems, you cannot use Pascal. You have to use you know, C or C++ because operating systems only support C and C++. So basically, we were given two weeks to learn C as a programming language. All the professor said was, here's a book, learn how to do it in two weeks. So within two weeks, we had the first homework assignment to use, in, to use pipes yeah. for inter-process communication <laughs> to play Pong. So I wrote that program, okay, and then, um, and then a little bit after that, you know, I noticed something is strange about the, the source code. You know, it was compiling the day before, and now it's not compiling. I, okay, please no food uh, during class time. Okay, yeah, just, uh, it's in the back, you know, there's a policy here. Yeah, drinks are okay as long as it's just plain water. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, as it turns out, you know, as time progressed, um, you know, files, you know, started to disappear, and it, you know, random content started to appear, you know, in files and stuff like that. As it turned out, it was a, a hardware failure, but it wasn't a hard drive failure, which would be preferred. It was a controller failure. So it was basically putting wrong content onto the hard drive just randomly. Ooh. That's the worst kind of corruption because it's not like, poof, it's dead, okay? <laughs> it, it's still alive, just not doing what it is supposed to. So we lost, so I lost the entire folder for that whole, for that whole homework assignment. And there was no backup. The guy who was managing the servers did not do any backup. You know, and the most recent one was like a month ago. So I had to rewrite the entire program. And I was glad that I, was, that I did. Because you know, the second version, or the second time I wrote the program, it was clean, it was a lot simpler, and I understood the concepts a lot better. So just to encourage you to. <laughs> no, <I'm like> <laughs> so sometimes it's better to rewrite things than to just you know, fix what you have. <clears throat> so same thing happened at work too. You know, I have to deal with programs. I had to deal with one single function that was more that had more than five hundred lines. Wow. Now that's not the worst of, of that. The worst part of it, it was it had go tos and labels all over the place. We are we are not talking about a single label at the very last line right before the return and just say, okay, I can't handle this anymore. We have to get out. Okay. That I can sort of understand, even though it's still not a very good approach. It had go-tos to go from inside the conditional statement, inside the loop, inside another conditional statement, into a switch statement, inside another loop, in, inside another you know, switch statement, or something like that. It's crazy. I, I looked at the code, it's 500 plus line, lo, lines long, and I could not understand it. What was it supposed to do? Um, it's a part of a compiler. Uh. <laughs> And the compiler was not written in a modular way either, so all the parsing code or parsing logic and the code, generating lo code generation logic, they're all intermingled mm -hmm. with global variables floating everywhere. Uh, yeah, I kept trying to clean that code up and my boss kept telling me, Tech, don't waste your time. We want to add more features. And they're like, no, I want to fix things. I want to make things that work better by fixing them first. Nope, nope, my boss wouldn't buy it. The first time I introduced a uh, pointer type checking, my boss me called me into his office and go like, Tech, what did you do? I go, well, I made the compiler better. And he said, but it broke my code. Well, obviously, you know, the guy had never learned about you know, type casting with pointers. So he was just using pointers all you know, without, without considering the types of the pointers. So the new feature of the compiler broke his code because I am actually moving more to more ANSI compliant. They go like ANSI stats this, and I need, I'm going to implement that. Yeah. So that was a, that was an interesting experience here yeah, with that workplace. Yeah, that's prior to uh, starting my job here. <clears throat> so I'll tell you guys more story about that maybe later. 
Okay. So the first thing we want to do is to go over the exam, the practice exam. So the next, so the exam is going to be next Tuesday. So we have one week, you know, to study for the exam. And th these are the uh, the practice exam questions. And I think I opened this up to everybody. So you guys should be able to click it on your mobile device if you want to, and actually view the content of the uh, of the exam. So the exam is going to be next Tuesday. It's going to be open book, open notes, including anything that you want to bring along with you that is either printed or handwritten prior to the exam. So if you want to print you know, all the relevant pages in Logisim to describe the components, go ahead. Okay, That's cool with me. Um, if you want to print out your know, screenshots from the YouTube stuff, go ahead. You know, that doesn't bother me. So anything that is printed or handwritten prior to the to the exam, you can bring it with you. Okay, but my suggestion is do not bring too much, because if you bring too much, it might become difficult to find what you need to find. Okay, so it, the test is more more about understanding than memorization. But I cannot. But you have to find out what you cannot remember, so that you can bring you know the paper with you, just so that okay, I need to look this up. Okay, but it, you are allowed to bring whatever you want. Yep. Is this written or scanned on? It is going to be written, so it's going to be open. Uh, so the test questions will be similar to these. It won't be exactly the same, obviously. Okay, so let's go ahead and get on with the uh, practice test. Question number one, observe the design of an SR latch. Okay, we talked about this well, a few weeks ago. When the input slash zero, slash s is zero, what output is guaranteed to be in a particular state? In a particular state, specify the output pin and the guaranteed state. Okay, so we are talking about this pin here being zero. So that goes into a NAND gate. So since we have a zero in a NAND gate, that guarantees the output to be a one. So Q is guaranteed to be a one. Is that okay? Regardless of you know, what the other state is, Q is guaranteed to be a one. But what about uh, slash Q? Can we do anything? Can we say anything about slash Q if slash S is a zero? No, not we, we cannot because we can. The only thing we can guarantee is this line here going into one of the inputs of the lower NAND two gate is guaranteed to be a one. But then the state of slash Q also depends on slash R, and I didn't say what about as uh, slash R. So we cannot guarantee the state of slash Q, but Q itself has to be a one. There's no no other options. So the correct answer is okay. The output pin that is guaranteed to have a particular state is Q, and the state, the guaranteed state is a 1. Is that okay? <coughs> so the next question is, if, I, if, if we never had talked about SR latches, but we did talk about NAND2 gates, would you still be able to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Should be able. Mm -hmm. Because NAND2 gate is the only thing that you need to know in this particular case to answer that question. Question number two, again, observing the design of an SR uh, okay, typo here, of an SR latch from question number one, enumerate all combinations of input pins that result in slash Q having a state of one. Okay, so what I'm expecting is people to tell me, okay, if the input is this, you know, if slash s is this and slash r is that, the output is going to be a 1, and so on. Now, since we answered the first question, don't you think the second question is a little bit easier to answer? OK, a little bit. <laughs> OK. So what combination of input pins will result in slash q, not q, but slash q having a state of 1? Uh, slash r being 0. Okay. Yep. Slash uh, r being 0. So the combinations would be you know, basically just slash r being a zero, regardless of what is slash s, right? Yeah. Slash s can be a one, can be a zero, and would still be it was we can still guarantee that slash q is a one. Yeah. So if I go to mouse pad, I can just give you what I would expect as an answer. So the answer is going to be in the form of a truth table. Um, or a limited truth table. So you basically have to look at you know the inputs. Slash S is an input. Slash R is an input. And I want slash Q to be a 1. 
So you basically have to say, okay, what can I do to make it a one? Okay, if slash r is a zero, and, and slash s is a one, the output is going to be a one as far as slash cube is concerned, but the other one also make sure that it is a one. So these two rows would be what I'm expecting from the answer of question number two. Yep? Are you reporting this, right? Um, I believe so. Now remember what, uh, what you signed off in the syllabus. You know, there can be technical difficulties you know, not intended, so you still need to kind of pay attention and you know, write, try to write down some notes to yourself. Okay. All right, question number three. Question number three says in binary subtraction, the result of a half subtractor is um, x not y or not x y. Okay, this notation we have talked about before. The negation applies to the immediate component next to it or to the right hand side of that. And then the so called multiplication is conjunction. Addition really means um, disjunction in this case. And then the borrow bit is this one here, derive the DNF disjunctive normal form of bit one of the result of a subtraction. Start with the general formula using R and B, and then expand and derive the DNF and show your steps. Okay. Do you guys remember this one? So you're just asking for Z0? Yeah, Z1. I think Z1 is the one that I'm asking for. Okay, so we're looking for Z1. Okay, so without, okay. So the first thing you might want to do is to look at the actual subtraction and say, okay, this is, this is something that should be pretty easy because you have done this in your homework assignment already. Okay. So we have Y1, Y0. Okay, does this look remotely familiar? <laughs> I sure hope so. <laughs> okay, so we have we have a zero here because you know we have a, or you know in this case it should be a b in. Okay, so this bit here is our z zero, which is the 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 bit zero of the result. This is bit one of the result, which is known as z one. So I want to know what is z one as a DNF. So okay. we'd have to go through the entire formula. You're going to copy from your homework assignment if this is actually the question. Can we just turn the page if we have it? <laughs> if you already have it, staple it to the <laughs> <for> exam. <laughs> awesome. As long as it meets all the requirements, which means you start with an R and a B, mm -hmm. okay, you do the expansion, and then you turn everything into a DNF. If it is on that piece of paper, staple it. Cool. So this question will cost you a single staple. <laughs> if you had that already. But if you don't, what do you do? You derive it, right? So let's go ahead and derive it. This is not that bad, okay? It is really not that bad. Okay, Z1 is the result of two subtractions, okay? So it is the result of a subtraction, and we are subtracting the result of subtracting X1 and Y1 from X1, and we are subtracting the borrow from the previous bit. Okay, so the borrow from the previous bit, okay, let me just go over there here. So the borrow of the previous bit, there are two ways to set this borrow. One way to set this borrow is x1 minus y, excuse me, x0 minus y0 yielded a borrow. And then the other way to yield a borrow is the um, result of, oh, the borrow of the result of x0 minus y0 and b in. Okay, matching the parentheses. Yep, I think that should be it. Uh, isn't that the borrow of x1, y1, or the borrow of the result of x0, y0, vn? Which, which part of it? Uh, right there. This one? Yeah, I thought that was the borrow of x1, y1. No, it, because it comes from here. We're trying to figure out the DNF of this particular bit. Uh. So, the, so we are subtracting this one here. Okay, that is actually this guy here, right? We are subtracting, okay, this number here is the result of, is the, is the result of the half subtractor, subtracting y1 from x1, okay? And then, but what we are subtracting from that is 
this particular bit here. Ah, I see. But there are two ways to set that particular bit. One way to set it is the subtraction of y x zero minus y zero, which is represented by this b here. And the other way to set it is this bit here, which is the result of x zero minus y zero minus b n. But we don't care about the result itself, which is z zero. We only care about the borrow. Did it give me a borrow? But because there are two ways to set that particular bit, I have to use a or to combine those two sources of setting that particular bit. No, it is still a borrow because you know x zero minus y zero can yield a borrow can yield a one here and that be, that is the borrow bit of x zero minus y zero. Okay. Right? This is coming straight from the homework oh, assignment. Yeah. I remember it. It's just that, you know, do you, you know, but as a practice question, you know, I can use anything that is, you know, in the, in the homework assignments, and this is an easier one. Okay, so the next thing you need to do is to expand it, okay? So the, my way to expand this is to deal with the easy one first. So I would deal with this one first, which is x1, not y1, or not x1, y1. So I'm expanding this one. And then the second portion is to uh, expand the B. The B is going to be yeah. not x0, y0, okay, negating the first one. So now we have to expand the second one. And I only do one level expansion each time because I don't want to make this too complicated for myself. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So now I want to expand the B. Okay. Now obviously you cannot do this you know, in the test because you won't be using a computer. You will be using paper and pencil. So I want to expand this B here. So the way I usually do this is I do it like this, which is really hard to do or harder to do without um, the use of an editor. Like that. Is that okay? Did everybody see what I just did? Yes. So I do it structurally first and then you know go ahead and combine and pull stuff from the previous line. And then once I have this, I can resolve the R. But remember, this is something that you have done already. If, if I'm just you know pulling something from your homework assignment. So now I can eh? Um, you know, I just want to expand everything first. So I expand this here, expand this over here, and then expand this over here, and this over here. Now this one is a little bit on the extreme, in the extreme case. You know, in other words, it is a little bit longer. But I want, to, I want to bring this back up because I want to remind you guys that you have done this already as a part of your homework assignment. So this, is, this really should be a refresher of what you have already done. Okay, so from here on, it really is just a matter of um, applying De Morgan's Law and getting everything into the D and F you know, format. All right, so now we take this and say, okay, what is the first thing that we want to do? I personally like from, to work from the inside out, so I want to clean up the inside first. So this is the first one I want to clean up is to apply De Morgan's Law to this one. So now I have the negation of this. Oops. Um, brand here times the negation of that. I only apply the Morgan's Law once, and then I can do the same thing here. I distribute the negation to the inside, but I have to turn the disjunction into a conjunction. And then we have Nope, that's you still it. have to pull down the, the second line from the line above. Up, up, up. There. That has to go at the end. Hmm, I wonder why I didn't, didn't copy, copy it. I did not. Okay. No, all of it. The whole line. The whole line. Because if you look one line above at the end, it says not x0, y0, yeah. or not. Oh, okay, I see. 
So I have to go from there. Okay. Not quite all the way. You already you got the, to the you already got that starting the portion line. there. On oh, okay, the gotcha. Line below. Huh. So it's just that. I wonder how. Okay, there we go. So we can apply the Morgan's law one more time here. So in your test, it's not going to be as involved because I don't. I know you guys do not have an editor. You know, you won't have as much time. But this is what it takes. Okay, so I might give you something that is simpler, that does not actually correspond to a subtractor or an adder, but it will still be the application of the R, which is the identical whether you're adding or subtracting. The C is only for adding, and then the B is only for subtracting. <coughs> But I don't want to you know, at least go at least you know, maybe one more step you know, to get rid of you know, the. I actually disclosed the answer to this particular question already, so this is all being. You didn't copy the second line again. Oh, again. Okay. How many people know that I have done this part already? Okay. So if you go to the notes here, I think I posted in the forum. So for those of you who did not realize that the, this key is already in the notes or it's already disclosed, go to the news forum. I think I posted it in the news forum. Uh, solution of the two by two subtractor. Now I can actually go into Moodle and find out how many people clicked on this one. <laughs> and I can know exactly who clicked and who did not click. But this is the answer, okay? So when you open this one, it has a single text file. And when you open the text file, I can use, well, the very off space would be fine. That's the answer to Z1. Now, I know it is nasty, okay? You know, I understand that part. <laughs> However, the approach is what I'm testing. I'm not going to be testing whether you guys can do all of this during the exam, so it will be simplified. On the other hand, you know, you do want to make sure that you understand how everything is derived. If you have done so yourself already and your subtractor works, you already know this stuff. It's really just a matter of, okay, refreshing yourself of what is R, what is C, what is B, how to apply the Morgan's Law, how to apply the distributive law, and so on. Okay, if those concepts you know, sounded foreign, then you might need to revisit you know, those particular lectures. So it, once again, I don't want to, to turn this into a chore thing where you know, the, the highest grade is assigned to the person who can write the fastest. You know, I, don't, I, don't want it, I don't want to be like that. Um, it's basically just you know, testing whether you understand you know, the result, the carry, and so on. Yep? Will the definitions of any functions we need to use on the exam be provided on the exam, like R or I C probably can include that, but since it's open book and open notes, <laughs> so I think you guys should, as you study, you can make your own quote unquote cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a cheat sheet because you know it is allowed in the exam. The only thing that is not allowed is some any form of communication during the exam. So. So anyway, um, if you have not seen this, you know you should probably see it one more time. So I think Z0 is a lot more reasonable you know, as a test question because it is a little bit faster to derive. Okay. All right, so getting back to the practice questions. So let's move on to the next one. Question number four, specify all bus memory bus operations to write the content of 6D to a location of E2 of a RAM chip. Assume the RAM chip is the default RAM module from LogiSim and has the same ports. You may assume port A and port D, okay, this is supposed to be D, are both aided wide. Okay, so how do we, how do you, how do we specify that? So the first thing you want to do is to remember what ports are on a memory chip, on the RAM chip. And what I'll do is I am going to do this without bringing up LogiSim and see how much you guys can remember just from discussions of the RAM chip itself. Okay, so we'll make a truth table again. It's not a truth table, it's more like a, uh, a table that tells you all the different things that, that you need to do in order to write that content into a RAM chip. Okay, so we know there's an A port for at the address. We know there's a D port for the data. 
What other ports do we have for a RAM chip? Yep. Clock load and enable. We have a clock. Okay. And the enable is called chip select, which is CS. And then what else? Load. There's a clear. There's also a load. Okay, very good. Okay. So these are the ports of a RAM chip. A is the address bus. It specifies the location. You know, which location in the memory chip do we want to do something about? The D is the data, which can be bi which is bi-directional, which means it can specify content onto the data bus, but it can also receive information from the data bus. Clock is the transition. Remember, a RAM chip don't only writes to memory on a rising edge. Okay, it's rising edge sensitive. CS is chip select. If chip select is not uh, high for a particular chip, it doesn't pay attention to anything. So you better make sure that chip select is a one before you do anything here, before you do anything important. Clear is reset. It changes all the content of the RAM chip to zero, which probably is not what we want to do here. And the load pin specifies where there's a load or a, um, where there's a read or a write operation. If LD is a one, is a read operation. If LD is a zero, it is a write operation. A write operation is seen from the perspective of the processor, so we are changing the content on the RAM chip if LD is a zero. Okay, so given these are the ports that we have to specify, and let's go back to the question itself. The question is, yeah. So you said if LD is zero, we are changing, we are writing. Writing. We are, uh, we are changing the content of the of the RAM chip. If LD is a one, then we are reading the content from the RAM chip. Okay, so the question is asking. You know, how do you write a content of 6D to the location E2? Okay, so content means, you know, the actual content of the location. And this is a write operation. So wh what do you need to do to specify these things here? Okay, let's start with CS. Okay, that's the easy one. Yep? I was just going to ask with the 0x before the location. That's hexadecimal. Hexadecimal representation. Base 16? Yeah. We talked about hexadecimal representation. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. telling you that's Okay. Yep. Yeah. So CS has to be a 1 because otherwise the chip is not paying attention at all. <clears throat> and the clock is needs to be needs to have a transition. So we want to specify, we want to set up everything when the clock is a, at a low state so that when everything is all set up and then we turn it into a high state, then we have a rising edge transition and then things will actually be done during the transition itself. The address bus is specifies the location. So according to the question, the location is E2. So we specify a E2 over here. The content that we are writing to RAM is 6D. So we want to specify the 6D as my data. Okay, six, oops, 6D. Clear needs to be a zero because we want we don't want to change the content of RAM to all the zeros, and then the load has to be a zero because we are writing we are writing to RAM we are not reading from RAM. Okay, so this is how you set up. Okay, and then the one more row. So the next row basically just says maintain everything except for the clock. So everything remains exactly the same. If you don't put the remain the, the same symbol, I will assume everything remains the same. And that's it. This is the answer to that question. You set up all the ports, make sure the clock is low during that time, but chip select is high, and then you do a low to high transition on the clock line, and then we'll get it done. Do we have any questions about this one? Yep. So that's just uh, data going from one part of the chip to the other part of the chip? Nope, the data is coming from the data port. So when we tested the RAM chip in class, I plopped a RAM chip you know, and all kinds of input pins and output pins. Do you guys kind of remember that? Okay, so this is basically just doing that but on a piece of paper. So you just have to specify you know, what line is high, what line is low, you know, and then you need a transition, a you know, low to high transition in this case, to actually change the content of RAM. Is that okay or not? Yep. 
I would do that. Yeah. Yep. So this is yeah. this is how like, I would answer it's that. Like, question. It's like how I change the number or something. Yep, except we are doing it, you know, with a piece of paper instead of clicking the pins. Yeah, it makes sense. It's like set up everything that you're, that this is what I want to happen, yep. and then make it happen. Yep. All right. So any questions about this one? Yep. What is the, so is that an address? Oh, oh so that's, that's the actual data is 60. 6D is the bit pattern that should be presented on the database. We have to write the 0x when we are sent to E2. It will be sent to the location E2. E2 oh, is going to be the location addressed on the RAM chip. And then the co the new content to override whatever was there before is 6D. So it will have a new content of 6D on the rising edge. Yeah, it was just mm -hmm. confusing me that the, that the addresses and the, the data counts are the same. Mm, did I flip? No. No. no, the location is E2 and then the content is 60. Wait, well, yeah, just that it's a, it's a, uh, that we're writing it in text instead of binary? Yeah, that it's a, it's representation. All the, all the stuff in the RAM chip is in text. Yeah, yeah. everything in LogiSim has been in When, text. yeah, when we play with LogiSim, the pins are in binary. And then, but the content of RAM and ROM are both in hexadecimal. Yes? Will we have anything more complex on the exam? Like, let's say, four or five rows in a table like this? For mm, question? Not for this particular question, but the last question is going to be a little bit more complex. Okay? So we'll, it's, it's, it's kind of like a super duper music box you know, question. Oh but that one is, that really is what I want to test, okay? That, you know, the, this is considered warm up for, the, for this particular exam. I, I think it was the word of that confused me because that made me think it was an address. Wait, which of? The right, content, the content of okay. 60. Oh, he, he thinks you're moving the content that's in address 60 to that's, address E2. That's what confused me. 60 is, is the new data, is the new yeah. content yeah. Yeah. of that okay. location. That's, I understand that now. Yeah, so during the exam, if you have confusion you know, or if you want to want me to better explain the questions, you know, just go ahead and ask me. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, question number five. Complete the following long binary addition. Specify all the carry bits as well as the result bits. Okay, so this is what I want you guys to do. Oh, also read the little note here. Know that since the result can be computed by a scientific calculator, which is allowed, okay, um, point values are assigned only to the carry bits, not the actual final answer. <laughs> so what the calculator cannot tell you is what actually counts for grade for the for the points. <laughs> well, unless you write a program on your scientific calculator <laughs> to, to give you all the carry bits, right? Well, if you can do that, okay, assuming that is actually your program, then you know this stuff already, right? <laughs> of course, there's other, there are always cases of, you know, okay, you know, you borrow the program from somebody else who actually do this stuff, right? Which would kind of your definition to be That is, yeah, yes. I call okay. it resourceful. Resourceful. <laughs> okay, so you zero plus down. one is one, okay? One plus zero is a one, but neither addition ends up with a it ends up with a carry. So this would be a carry of zero. One plus zero is a one. One plus zero is a one, and neither gave me any carry. So this would be a zero as well. One plus one is a zero, with a carry already. Zero plus zero is a zero. Zero plus one is a one. One plus one is a one. This is the extra carry that you also have to indicate. And then zero, and then one plus one is a zero. So the, so the answer to this question should be in this format. You spell out the intermediate results of the half error. Is that okay? It's kind of what I do you know, when I do subtraction or addition in class anyway, so this is not a new format. It's just that, you know, showing in this so that you know what you have to write as the answer. Yep. We have the full class time for the exam? Yes, we'll have the entire class time, which is 80 minutes for the exam. Yeah. 
Do you expect it will take that long? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to make sure that, you know, this is from my perspective, you know, I will make it so that it's not, um, it won't take that long if you understand the material. So it's not about, you know, writing fast. It's about, you know, whether you understand the material and be able to apply that. Okay, so question number six has to do with the D flip-flop. Describe the state of input pins to ensure that the output pin Q is a one. So how do I make sure that this particular pin here is a one? Describe a sequence of signal changes if that is needed. In other words, if there's a particular sequence that you need, then specify that sequence. Yep, go ahead. I was gonna ask if um, you had some starting values for this whole thing. You, can, you, you cannot assume any particular starting value. So you have to, regardless of the current state of this entire circuitry, you have to present or tell me how to change the input pins so that the Q as an output pin has a value of one. Okay. So you, know, okay. Work backwards. you can work backwards or you can look at the behavior of a D flip-flop because that, there's a truth table in my notes about you know the um, how to turn is, the output into a one. Is this exact question going to be on there, or is just like a question like this? Like it will be questions like this. So this is a. Yeah, it's a. It's to give you both the scope of the of the exam and also give you an idea of the type of question. Hey, you never know. It might be like box. <laughs> yep. So for this question <laughs> and also the SR lab question. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, a truth table of all possible values exactly that match the this. You could do that. Yes. Okay. You can do that too. But having the truth table, you know, uh, available to you during the exam is going to be helpful. Yeah. Exactly. But there won't be any borrowing of you know any type of material during the exam. So you have to make sure that you bring your own materials. Now, if you guys can work on the material together prior to the exam, I don't have a problem with that. Study together, you know, come up with a cheat sheet you know, together, and but there's no sharing during the exam. Okay, so you guys come up with a cheat sheet, make photocopies of that, and each person can bring his or her own during to the class. And then for this case, we could I just staple my uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and highlight the row. Yeah. Okay, so which row would that be? Okay, which row will guarantee that Q is a one? Which is actually why we call this a D flip flop. Yep, go ahead. Uh, yep, that's it. So we need both D and clock to be ones in this case. But no transition is required. Okay, so one single row is enough for this case. Because a D flip flop is level sensitive, it is not edge sensitive. The change does not happen during a transition, the change happens as soon as you present the input. So in this case, D equals 1, CLK equals 1 is the answer. Question number 7 is D question. <laughs> okay, so when we look at this, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty sure most people look at this and go like, holy smokes, you know, what is that? It's a music box, except it's a bigger music box that doesn't really just do the LED thing. This one actually does something supposed to be useful. Okay, so we'll analyze this design, this design and see if we, we recognize anything that we have seen in previous classes. So that's one way to kind of read a question or read a design is to say, okay, do we see anything in here that resembles something that we already know? What are the components and how are they connected? Okay, so we start with something simple. This is a register, okay, and this is an atom. And I'm really hoping by now that you guys already know, can recognize what a register looks like and what an atom looks like because that's in your music box for my assignment. So how am I hooking these two up? The output of the register, which is the D port, connects to one of the inputs of the adder. The other input is zero, zero. And then the carry in is a one. And then the output of the adder goes back into the input of the register. Is that okay? Just like we expected. Just just like what you did with your music box homework assignment, right? And then the other pin, which is the enable pin here, is connected to a constant of one, which means the register is always enabled, it's always ready to update. Is that okay? But the register, even with the enable pin turned on,
does not update unless there's a rise in edge. And the clock line is here. So there's a clock line here. Back to the clock. And the clock line is shared to all the other registers. Okay, so we'll take a look at the other registers later, okay? But we want to focus on this sub-circuit here. So as far as this sub-circuit is concerned between the register and the adder, are there any questions about it? What does it do? It's one stepping up. It's stepping up each. It each increments. Register. Yep. It auto increments on each uh, rising edge of the clock. Yep. You can have multiple registers enabled, but in this case, there's only one here. So, any questions about this part of the circuit? Yep. Because there's an initial period of one, does that mean it's stepping by two every time? Mm, no. No, because, by one. because the other number is always a zero. Okay. So, you're adding zero plus one to whatever is in the other input port every single time. So, we're just adding one. Any other questions about this one? Just the just this part of the subcircuit. Okay, looks good. Okay, what about the output of the register? In, in, in addition to feeding it into the adder, where is it going? Into the RAM. Into the, into the, RAM the address mm -hmm. of the ROM module. Okay. Right. Is that resembling anything with your homework assignment? Yes. Still, yeah. Exactly the same thing in your homework assignment, right? The select pin of the ROM is a constant one, which means the ROM is always selected. There's always something output to the data port, just like in your homework assignment. Yep, go ahead. Any questions? Good. So the yeah, only difference between this one and your homework assignment is what are we doing with all those bits spewing out of the data port, right? Your homework assignment hook up these things, these things to the seven segment LED display. So they will display 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, back to 0, and so on. Whereas this one has all these things going somewhere else. So what the circuit can do now depends on the upper part of the circuit. Okay, This is the upper part of the circuit. Does it resemble anything that we have talked about in previous classes? And if so, what exactly is it? What, what do you think it does? 32-bit register of some kind. These are all 80 registers, so the 8E indicates they're 8 bit registers. Okay, so they're all 85, and there are four of those. Um, there's a decoder here, there are two multiplexes over here. Did we talk about those components? Not the decoder. Yeah. No, we talked about the decoder. We talked about the decoder. decoder. Use the decoder only once. Yeah. yeah, once for, uh, because he said it's like this. Yeah, when we're getting the there's something out. special about it. When we're building he a built one. little, um, he built the decoder. I must have missed it last week. Anyway. He built the decoder. Something special. A decoder. About it. I built a decoder. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because you know, depending on the input, it will. Okay. So the input, it's there are two input pins. In this case, there are two. The one with a single gray dot on top of that is always there. Okay, that's the select pin. Those are the select pins. So in this case, because there are four outputs, there are two select pins. If the two select pins are zero, 0, then the zero output pin is going to be a one, but everything else is going to be a zero. Yep. So it's like a splitter, but we get to choose which output pin. It's kind of it's kind of like a D multiplexer where the input is a constant one. Okay. Because a D multiplexer is doing the reverse of a multiplexer, where you have one single input, but you have multiple outputs, and you're selecting you know, which output connects to the input. But a decoder is like a demultiplexer, but the input is always a one. Oh, okay. So you're just saying, okay, I'm going to output a one anyway, but who's going to get it? Mm -hmm. And it's the select pin selects that. that okay? But this one differs from what we talked about in class in just a minor way, because there's an additional signal here. This is the enable one, the enable pin. It's connected to the constant. Enable pin, it's sorry. connected to the constant one at the bottom. It is not a constant one. This one actually hooks up to one of the pins of the output of the ROM. Uh, pin six. Yeah, Good memory. Wow, that is impressive. Well, I was going to ask you because uh, you've got this decoder hooked up to pin zero one, which can only have what? That's, that's two bits, so I guess you can control it. Okay, I see what you're saying. You, it only takes two bits. Zero one, two, I just three. need to specify which one of the output is that makes a one. Sense. That's why you so said I can select two. which register yes. is enabled. So you can look at these outputs here, yeah, on this line here. It goes to the EN of each 
register. So you're controlling which register you actually control. enable. You gotta enable it. Okay? But remember, even when you enable a register, it doesn't get updated until you have an edge for the yeah. transition. Okay? So, so the edge transition is the one that makes it update. Okay. So when you look at this subcircuit here, okay, we have something that is familiar. Okay, what about the other part? Poking up these four registers through two boxes into the adder. Have we seen anything like that in previous classes? Not yet. <laughs> you missed that class. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that class, but I think I recorded it and it should be yeah. online. Okay. Online. But we did, okay? You know, when we go to YouTube, you know, you will find that we actually talked about this as well. Okay, so we have a multi we have two multiplexes here. This is a multiplexer. I remember we talked about this because I looked up Thomas Train Track stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I can remember other you know material in the classes here by the di digression that I took. Okay, so we did talk about this. Okay, so a multiplexer has multiple inputs. The select pins, like okay, which one of the inputs? becomes the output of the multiplexer. Do you guys vaguely remember that? Okay. Yeah. So one multiplexer specifies what goes into the first input port of the adder. The other one needs to be second port of the adder. Okay. In other words, I'm using the multiplexer to say, oh, uh, which two registers I, am I adding? Okay. What about the result of the adding? I think it's stored, it goes it's here, stored in the register. Depending on which the is on. And it feeds into the data port or the D port of every single register. But I'm not updating all of the registers You're because which one is updated which depends on which one is enabled, which is controlled by the decoder. So with this circuit, I am capable of selecting which two register I'm adding and which one I am which one is storing the sum of those two of the which one is storing the sum of the addition. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yep. To add two values, you have to enable two registers at the same time, right? Yes. No, 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 no. But no, 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 no. Okay. The output of the register is selected by the multiplexer. So this is how you feed into the adder. But the adder only gives you one result, which is the sum, right? You only need to store the sum in one of the four registers. No, no, I mean one register sent in first um, multiplexer and second register supposed to send second value to second right. multiplexer. So yes. in that case, you have to enable two registers. No. no. no the enable is only used for changing the register. The register always outputting something. The output always goes. It's the always output out. is constant. Yeah, the output, output is, is constant. constant. It's the input that changes with the enable. If yep, exactly. Okay. <coughs> if you enable your change, if enable is off, it stays the same, but the output still goes. Okay, multiplexer has select in kind of like the Okay, in that case, you figure out which register will be added. Okay, correct. I got it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it like a rising edge when the clock is moved to one that triggers the change? Correct. So, so the, the, the edge point? sensitivity is can be changed. The default is on the rising edge, but you can change it to a falling edge. And that's why in the question, I specify that too. So in the question, I specify, um, let's see here. Hmm, I thought I specify a falling edge somewhere. It's the last thing you wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the music box register updates on the falling edge, where the other registers update on the rising edge. That is needed because you know if I use you know rising edge for everything, I can end up with a with a raised condition. So I don't want a raised condition, so that you know the uh, the music box register is updating on a falling edge. So that will give me plenty of time to settle everything else before the rising edge to the other four registers to you know uh, taking in the input of the app. All right. So let, let's go back to the design. Let me see if there are any additional questions about the design itself. Is that the answer of what it is? There's no answer. That's the answer question. Oh. Okay. So, but I want to make sure that there are no further questions about the components of the design or you know how it is laid out. It is the combination of two sub circuits that we have talked about. 
The first one is the music box circuit, which is down below, which is a part of your homework assignment. And then the other one is the, the using multiplexers with a, some, some sort of element to the calculation. And then the ability to store the result back into one of the registers. Is that okay so far? Okay. So now let's go ahead and read the, the actual question. What are you going to do about this thing? So assume the music box register starts with a value of zero, which means there's no need to reset everything to zero. You just assume that it starts with a value of zero for this question. Specify the content in the ROM to add the values of register A and register B to register D. In other words, I want you to accomplish this. Okay? I want you accomplish this in C and C++. I want you to take whatever D already has, register D, and just add the content of register A to register D first, and then the second operation is to do the same thing to register B. Is that okay? Yep. All right. So Note. So we're figuring out what's inside of ROM. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So note how the clock line connects to all the registers. You may also assume the clock line starts with a low state. In other words, you know, the first row assumes that the clock is going to be in a low state to begin with. Okay? And um, the register, uh, the music ball register already has a value of zero to begin with. The decoder has an enable pin. If the enable pin is zero, then all outputs are zero. If the enable pin is a one, then the output pin of what is that is selected is a one where all the other pins are zeros. All the out, other output pins are zeros. All registers are 8-bit. The ROM has an 8-bit A port, an address port, an 8-bit data port. To avoid race conditions, the music box register updates on falling edges, whereas the other registers update on rising edges. Yep. Uh, I noticed that on the data port, we're only using six of those. Yep. So the, so the eighth pin, or the most significant bit, you can use anything you want. Uh, and the eighth bit would be the most significant? The seventh bit is the most, uh, or seven. oh, bit seven, I should bit call seven. it. Bit seven is the most, most significant, is the one which is not connected. Okay, exactly. Just double check. Yeah, so we have zero to one going to here. We have two to three going to here. Four to five going to here. And if bit six is on its own, going to here. Cool. And do you care if we uh, give the answer in hex or binary? It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Okay. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So can we admit bit seven since it's not? You can specify anything you want. Bit 7 is not used. Okay. Yep. You can, you can make your design send out SOS with bit 7 if you want to. <laughs> a short, a long, and a short. As you perform the, uh, the rest of the operation, you're, <laughs> you're sending a secret code in SOS. <laughs> Do you know Morse code? Huh? Do you know Morse code? Only SOS. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only because my flashlight has an SOS mode, yeah. and I, which sometimes I accidentally get into. <clears throat> All right, so how do, you, how do we approach this one? It is really the same thing as working on your homework assignment, except this time you want to achieve a particular result of this. Okay? All right, so looking at the design, I'm going to work on this step by step. Okay, we'll use a, um, yeah, you can use this. All right, so what we need to do is to figure out not the bit pattern initially, but to figure out what needs to be done first, okay? And then we'll translate that into, okay, what is the bit pattern to get this to work, okay? So let's go ahead and figure out what we need to do. Um, the first thing we need to do is to perform this operation, D plus equal to A, well, these, are, these are registers. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that A is going into the adder. We need to make sure that D is going into the adder. Okay, so we want um, first mux to specify register A. Okay, since addition is commutative, it doesn't really matter which one is A and which one is D, but if it were a subtraction, then it does matter which one is A and which one is D. Second box to specify register D. Okay, so we have to specify that first so that the adder now has the content you know, of what is what it is going to add. Okay. 
And then when it's done adding, which doesn't take an entire clock cycle, I can, you can make the assumption that calculations are all done within a very short amount of time. So we have to take the output of the adder and then put it back into register D. Okay, so how do we make that happen? Decoder. We need to use the decoder, okay? So the decoder enabled, and then the decoder needs to specify register D as the input, right? And then we need a clock cycle in order for the register to update, okay? So we need a rising edge. Okay, so the clock needs a rising edge at this point. After the rising edge, it needs to have a falling edge so that we can advance to the next um, location in the ROM, right? Okay, so clock, falling edge. And then we have to set up pretty much the same thing for the second operation, okay? So we have pretty much the same stuff here. And then we, we just change register A to register B. And then we perform everything else the same way. And I think that should be it. All right, so this is you know, just writing in English you know, in very brief and kind of concise format what needs to be done. So now we have to translate each one of these into you know, bit specifications, okay? And that really is just looking up the, looking up the design and say, okay, what is the what is the first mux? You know, what two bits control the first mux, and how do we specify register A? So you have to look at the design, and this is really the tedious part. Okay, the tedious part is to say, okay, the top mux is specified by bits two, three of the of the ROM. So we need, okay, so we just say, wait, so isn't it four? Yeah, it looks like two. Zero one is the top one. Yeah, it's four five. It's four five. You're right. Okay, so it's four five specifying the top mux. So the one way to do this is to specify the bit locations using one two three four five six seven eight. So this is zero, one two three. This is four five. Okay, so we need these two to be zero zero to specify register A. But at the same time, we also want the second mux to specify register D. According to the schematic, the second mux connects to bits two, three. So that means. Wait, don't you want them to be yeah, one, one, one instead of zero, zero? Zero, zero means they're off, and one, one means they're zero, off. Zero, 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 zero means they're off, it means it's selecting bit A. Yep. Or register like A. No, power is only out of it? No, zero, zero, it, it's a selection on the mux. Oh, yeah, if it was oh, zero, one, it Because was what like a box does is it's a switch. Oh, 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 okay, okay. I got it, I got it. I, I was thinking of something totally different. Yeah, so in my, mind, in my mind, I'm still thinking of the, the little diode that needs yeah. the power to change. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, no, I get it. Yeah, I was thinking, I know, we were I know thinking that was an enabling. You were thinking enable. Yeah, yeah. 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 So using two bits, we can, you can change the rotation of the turntable. Because zero, zero means you're turning it like yeah, this. I, zero, one. We were thinking. One, one zero, zero one, and then one one. one. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what. Yeah. What you did, what you're putting in it is basically saying which one. Yeah. Which one I'm not looking at. That's what yeah. you put. You're How put, would you're you connect? In, yeah, you're putting in the like. The which one? Which one of the four? Yeah. Is this mugs? You can look at this. You can look at the select bits as kind of the address. Not. You could. What's like that? Yeah. yeah. I get it. Okay. okay. So. But we need a second one to specify D, which is a 1-1. One, one. Because you, if you follow this line here, this is the one going to register D. So we need a second one to be a 1-1. One, one. And we can specify those at the same time because they're not conflicting. We don't need to specify these in different cycles. Um, we need to enable the decoder, which is bit 6. So we need that to be a 1. And then we also need to specify uh, register D using the decoder, and I think one that one goes one. into here. So one one is specified here, and this one, you know, I use an X to specify that it can be any bit. But if you want to use a constant of zero or constant of a one, you know, either way is good. Okay. And then there's one more thing. Okay, so this is the output of the DROM. So this is the ROM D port. Okay, but we also have to specify one more thing, which is the clock line. The clock line is assumed to be low to begin with, right? 
So we need a transition to high so, we can that so that we can clock the sum into register D. And then on following it changes. And then on the next one, we need to, then we need to go back to zero, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this one doesn't belong here because we want the rising edge over here. After the rising edge, we want to have a falling edge. <coughs> And after the following edge, we want a very similar pattern here, except it's going to be 0, 1, 0, 1, X, 1, yeah. 0, 1, one and then one, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, again. And the clock is already a 0. We want to Make it one, right? have a rising edge. And that should do Just all the question. operations. Yep? Shouldn't the first two bits be 1, 1, and then bit 7 be next? Since bit 7 is done, you Bit seven is on the left. Yeah, the most significant bit is on the left. The least significant bit is on the right. It goes from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is bit zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, bit seven. Yeah. Oh, that makes so much more sense. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> I hate how it's backwards. Well, that's how we write the base ten numbers as well. In other words, you know, if I were to if I'm giving you 120, like if I'm giving you 199 yeah, dollars, 199 is written this way. This is the least like significant like digit. So I'm sweater. not giving you it's 991 dollars. So like you, you <laughs> want to say oh, the first one's a zero. It's a convention <laughs> thing. There's no particular reason why we write numbers using the most significant digit to the left hand side. It's just the way we write numbers. Well, it's like we say one place That's on really the right, ten <laughs> places to the left of that, right. hundreds places to the left of that. So as you go left, it always gets bigger. Yeah, but that's just a convention. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing more than just a convention. Yep. So the answer to this question is these bit patterns here. You just have to specify the content in ROM. So in this case, you have to specify two locations in ROM. The first location has this content, and the second location has this content. The clock line, you don't have to specify, because the clock line is connected to, to the clock signal, so that's done automatically. You don't have to specify clock low, clock high, clock low, clock high. You just assume the clock is going to go click, 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 click all the time. You only have to specify the content of the first two locations, in this case, in the ROM. Right, we can actually put these in binary. You don't have to like then after that, convert it to hex. If you want to convert to hex, you know, these are, so you can use a C, F, and a DF. I'm or you can have a use table that uses that. Yeah. So this one can be a one one zero zero one 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 one, which means it is a. This is a CF. Or if you prefer to use a zero for the most significant bit, then you have a four F. But both are valid. They're both, of, they're both valid because bit 7 is not connected to anywhere. Yep. And then the second one's going to be either a DF or a 5F. They both work. Yes? So I don't think my answer has a bit pattern. I could just do X, 101111, and so on. Yeah. I just think that 7, the most significant bit as X to indicate it's not, it is a non k irrelevant. Or I could put zero, or I could put one, and it'll be right. right. Can be all, can be any one of the, of the three. Yep. Question mark works the same way? Mm -hmm. Question mark is question the same as an X. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the exam, I may ask you in the same kind of question, but in a reverse way, I give you the actual ROM location and ask you, what does it do? What would happen to the registers? And the computation cannot can be act, you know, not exactly the same thing. Okay. So here's a quick question. Okay, you know, not necessarily it's going to be in the exam. But just a quick question: What happens when I feed the same register to the adder? What becomes the result? In other words, I specify register A and register A as the input to the adder, and then I put it back into register A. What am I actually doing? Multiplying it by two. I'm multiplying by two, which is also known as a shift. A shift, but which in which direction? To the left. It's the same thing as a left shift operation. Correct. Yep. All right. So that, are there any questions about any one of these forms of questions? 
why is it multiplied by two? Because it's, it's because it added to itself. It's number it's added to itself. It's positional though. That you don't just think that's about that. It's a plus it's a, which is a times Every two. Every position to the left is an increase in the power of two. So I'm feeding the same register to both inputs to the adder, but I'm taking the result and putting it back into A. I, I'm honestly, I don't get what shifting it means. Well, like I, I might not have an image of that. Just, operation that would be a shift like that? So uh, what is 100? Yeah. That's oh, a, that, okay. That's a left shift. Okay. You're moving all the you bits. Move, you're moving the point, okay. And but you're putting in a zero. Yep. Yeah, okay. zero. Okay. Yeah. 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 putting a zero. Okay. All right. Man. So are there any questions about the exam? What's the exam? It makes more, <laughs> well, it makes more, it now. <laughs> it makes more sense when it's like only ones and zeros, but if so it's like a... So to me, as far as yeah, I'm concerned, like, you know, this is one of the... A shifted over this is a, a really good question from my perspective, because it tests whether you understand the material and be able to apply what you have learned to solve a problem, okay? This is the design, I want to get this done, how do you make it happen? So it's a guarantee to be on the test? Some, in some way, in some form, you know, this will be in the test, yeah. Watch it happen, I like this. Like but it's, it's also a combination right. of things that we have talked about. It's not just one thing. We talk about the registers and the pen. We talk about using costs independently, but this one is kind of combining the two which is actually the really useful part. I mean, the music box is not very useful by itself. You're just cycling the numbers. One clock per, I don't know, 16. So in the test, I might give you, you know, something you know, of the same kind of complexity. I'll give you the design. I might add, ask it in a reverse way, which means I give you the wrong values, and then I ask you, okay, what's going to happen to the registers, and tell me step by step what is going to happen to the registers. Or I can ask you something like this, but to do something, to do certain operations in a different way. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Okay, so when you buy an Intel 7 i7 processor, is the only thing it can do addition, or can it do some other operations as well? You do a few other operations. <laughs> <laughs> As far as the ALU is concerned, it can do some other operations, right? It can do subtraction, it can do addition, it can do bit shifting. Now, bit shifting is interesting because shifting to the left can be done using the adder, which is just what I described a little bit earlier. But shifting to the right needs to be done in circuitry. There's no easy way to do a right shift using just addition. Okay? So most ALUs you know, have you know, innate abilities to do addition, subtraction, and also bit shifting, at least you know, right shifting. Left shifting can be done by addition. Okay, so let's take a look at the circuitry. This is not um, um, a part of the exam questions anymore, but since we are here already, we want to take a look at the ALU and say, but how does it work? How does the AL, how can you specify which operation to perform, and you know, so that you can extract the right result out of the ALU. So we'll go take a look at, uh, we'll take a quick look at, at the ALU design, okay? So java-jar, downloads, logic sim. <coughs> All right, so we'll go ahead and take a look at a quote-unquote ALU design. And an ALU definitely wants to be able to do a few things with what I described a little bit earlier. So it would be able to, yeah, it's kind of zoomed out. Okay, so it would have an adder, it would have a subtractor at least, okay? And it's going to have, you know, usually a shifter as well, and usually it is a right shift operation. And there are different shifts too, so I will explain these different shift operations. Okay, so when you look at a shifter, there are different type of shifts. Logical shift is really just, you know, putting in a zero at the end, at the opposite end. So a logical left shift means the least significant bit becomes a zero, where all the other bits you know, is shifted to the left by one position. <coughs> Are we okay? Yeah. A logical right shift is the opposite way. Everything is shifted to the right, but the most significant bit gets a zero. So it's basically the same number, just a zero at the left side. That's the most significant bit, yes. So what does a logical right shift actually do to whatever number you have? Divided by two. 
Is it the reverse of a, of a left position? So it takes a bit away yes. from the end and then shifts? Yep. And then just adds that zero at the end to complete it the... It adds a zero to the... That's the most significant okay. one. I see. What is the remainder? So if... Hmm? What is the remainder? The remainder is going to go shifted out of the shifter. So what happens if your so least significant bit on the it? right, the logical right, carry is, is a it? one? It's lost. It? Just gone. Yeah, it's just gone. gone. Whatever that bit is, it's so shifted like going to go out of the number. Unless the division okay. is on okay. two, then you can't just use a pure right shift to do the division of like decimal number. Yeah. Okay. okay. So what about the other three? Okay, we'll explain the rotation first. Okay, rotation is easy. Rotation means that you are moving the most, in this case, rotate left. <coughs> means you're taking the most significant bit, put it back into bit zero when everybody else is just moving over by one. That's a rotation. Okay. Is that okay? So when you look at a rotation, yeah, it. it's really just as the name implies. So a left rotation means all the bits here get shifted over by one position like this. But the bit what, what, which was originally here will become bit zero. That's a rotation. Huh. And the other way rotation is kind of the same thing, except you put the least significant bit into the most significant bit, and everything goes to the right-hand side by one position. Cool. OK? All right. So the only one that is kind of harder to explain is what is an arithmetic right shift. <coughs> OK, so there's logical right shift, and there's arithmetic right shift. The only difference has to do with whether the number is signed or not. Okay, so an arithmetic redshift preserves the sign of the number, whereas a logical shift does not. So if it's not signed, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we haven't, since we haven't really talked about signed numbers or how we represent negative values, so we are not going to use. A, we're not going to talk about arithmetic redshift at this point. But by the time we talk about signed numbers, then we can talk about that. Okay. So for the purpose of this particular discussion, I just need a logical right shift operator, okay? Because I can emulate uh, the other one using some other means. And typically, you also want to have a um, like an AND gate, you know, that sort of thing inside a, an ALU. So you can pick out, you know, two of the uh, gates here, okay? You can pick out an AND gate and the NOT gate. Uh, you can pick out an, yeah, so we'll pick out an AND gate here. And this is the one time that we change the data size to 8 bits, but we only have two inputs. And we can make it a little bit smaller so it doesn't take up as much space. There we go. All right. So let's say the, the, these are the four operations that I want to support inside an ALU. Okay. So we have this, and then we have this here. Okay. Now, when you look at the, the shift operator, um, it can, one specifies what number is being, that you're working on, and then the other one specifies how many positions you're shifting. So you can actually specify zero up to seven with this port, which only takes up three bits. Is that okay? So for the sake of this argument, or for this particular uh, design, <coughs> well, we can keep it the way it is, that's okay. <coughs> So the ALU, if you don't mind wasting you know, energy, one way to implement an ALU is to perform all the calculations all at the same time. Which means, in this case, I have a design that has two input ports, okay? And each one is a bit wide. And I'm just, you know, I, I just don't care about energy consumption. You know, remember that's the assumption is energy consumption is not a factor. So what I do is I'm just going to say, oh, let's go ahead and do this for adding. Let's use it for subtracting. Let's use it for conjunction, bitwise end, and also use it for bit shifting. And I will do the same thing with the other input pins. Let's use this one for adding, for subtracting, for bitwise end. And it gets a little tricky here because it doesn't like it. Because this is only a three bit port to specify which, how many positions to shift. So with this one, you have to do a little bit more work to make it work, okay? Because basically what you need in, in this case is a splitter, so you only make use of the least significant three bits. So that's an easy one to fix. You 
just go to wiring, go to a splitter, and we want to split. Pin out one pin out? Sorry? Is it a fit with three with a one pin out? Um, actually, we need a fan out of just one. Oh, that's fit width. Oh, this, uh, yep. Fit width is still eight, but we want a one width by turning off everything that we don't need. So you just say none, 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 none. There we go. Oops, that's not what I intend to do. Uh oh. Ah, uh, the mouse just died. Well, technically, it's a hamster because it has no tail. It's a cordless <laughs> mouse. I need to ask the department to get me my gaming mouse. <laughs> <laughs> what is that there we go. Okay, so now we have four operations, and they're happening at the same time. Every time I change the input points, it will do the calculations all at the same time. It will add, it will subtract, it will do the bitwise add, it will do the bit you know, rotation all at the same time. So how am I going to take the end result here? You know, how do I specify? I really just want the add this time. I just want the subtraction, I just want the bitwise end, or I just want the bit shifting. Put all of these into a mux and then add a controller? Yep, exactly. So that's what we're going to do. So now we take all of these and we specify a mux in plexers. Okay, we do plexer. We have four inputs, which means we need two select bits. And then we just combine the output here. Using the mux, okay, we are running out of time, but we have enough time to do this. Yeah, we have to change the data, data bits to eight. There we go. And this works too. Okay, this design will work as an ALU. Um, it's just that it's not. A, it's power hungry because every single time I change the input, all of these calculations are all happening at the same time. So it's going to be. You know, it's it's going to chew up a lot of power. Okay. Um, we have two minutes left. So within the two minutes left, I just wanted to kind of describe you know, why this is a power-hungry design. Okay, so what do you think is generating all the heat in your processor? The process. What makes it hot? From the transistor perspective, what makes it hot? Sorry? Right, we need to memory. Okay, so, okay, let me ask you in a, in a different way. Is it because the transistors are on that makes it hot? Is it because the transistors are off that makes it hot? Or is it because the transistor are changing state that makes it hot? Changing because, state. because they're changing state, okay? If you have a constant state of high, doesn't take up much energy. If you have a constant state of low, doesn't take up much energy. It is the transition of the states that is actually consuming power. Because we're dealing with MOSFETs, the last three letters of, F of FET is field effect transistor, which basically means it doesn't take much to turn on or turn off a transistor as long as it is a steady state. But it is the transition that is taking up the energy. Okay, so that means this design is really bad because every single time I want to do some calculations, it's going to exercise a lot of transistors at the same time, even though only a part of the calculation, a small part, is actually used. So it's not a very good design, but from the perspective of simplicity, it's fine. Okay, it's okay. It works. Is that okay? So to make the design a little bit better, it is much better to have you know buffers going into. Oops, use the wrong mouse again. It's better to use buffers here so that you know if you're not using a particular uh, calculation, the input to that calculator is not going to change. So to be basically disable, you know, a part of the circuit if you don't need it. You mean controlled buffers? Yeah. Or you can you can design the uh, the circuitry differently. Like the adder itself has an enable, mm -hmm. so you can basically disable the adder itself, so that it doesn't even do a single thing about the input. Mm -hmm. We don't have that uh, in Logisim, so we don't have the ability to specify and say, hey, adder, don't do anything. You know, the input does not apply to you. But in an actual processor design, this will be awful because you're, it's just going to be a super hot processor. This is going to be like a P4, except it's twice as hot. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? 
All right, so we are done with today's lecture. Um, in the lab portion, we can go over question number seven, and I can actually put in all the values, do the design in Logisim, and then we can watch it work. Okay? Because, you know, as I usually tell you guys, you know, do not trust what I claim to be the answer, right? So we want to actually see it happen. I am now. <laughs> yes, I am. I was still recording.